Are you ready? Yep, yeah. I'm all set. Okay. Good morning. The committee will come to order. I first want to thank the witnesses uh, for being here today to share your stories and perspective. Our committee has a long-standing tradition of working in a bipartisan manner on behalf of America's small businesses. Today, we can delve into a topic impacting small firms across the country, especially in our rural communities. With more than 146 million Americans across the nation, nearly half of the U.S. population participating each year in activities such as hiking, fishing, skiing, rafting, and biking, outdoor recreation is among the largest and fastest growing sectors of the U.S. economy. Recent data by the Bureau of Economic Analysis give us a snapshot of the growing force that is the outdoor recre recreation economy. In 2017, the industry accounted for 2.2% of GDP. In actual dollars, that is over $427 billion of economic output. To put that in context, that is a greater contribution than that of mining, utilities, and oil and gas production. In states like Montana and Maine, outdoor recreation is a significant portion of the overall state's GDP. And in many homes, in my own home state of New York, there are nearly 300,000 people employed in outdoor recreation jobs. Even more encouraging is that the industry out, is out, outpacing the rest of the economy. In 2017, while the U U.S. GDP grew at 2.4 percent, the outdoor recreation economy grew by 3.9 percent. Outdoor recreation is also extremely very reflecting the natural and cultural diversity of our entire country. The largest components of the recreation industry, manufacturing, finance, retail, hospitality, and transportation are all dominated by small businesses. It's also a driver of innovation and entrepreneurship. There has been an explosion in outdoor technical equipment and clothing, high-tech signaling devices, and protective gear. And improvements and advanced technologies continue to drive innovation in transportation vehicles such as snow mobiles, motorcycles, and other off-road vehicles. Because outdoor recreation directly creates so many local businesses and jobs, we in Congress play an important role supporting small firms in the industry. Healthy public lands, and clean air and water are the basic infrastructure of outdoor recreation. And without them, the industry cannot survive and thrive. That is why it is critical there is adequate and sustainable funding to maintain and modernize our national parks, roads, and bridges. We also need to cut the red tape many entrepreneurs face in the industry. For instance, there needs to be coordination and streamlining of the permitting process between federal land management agencies so that outfitters and guides that operate on public lands can get more Americans outdoors. We also heard that this is another industry that is being impacted by the administration's trade war as a result of tariffs on key recreational products, manufacturers of boats and RBs are facing higher input costs. Trading partners of the U.S. have levied retaliatory tar tariffs on American-made recreational products, resulting in lost export sales. We know that when this happens, small firms and consumers alike are paying the price through higher costs for outdoor activities and equipment, and more Americans are putting off that hiking or rafting adventure. As a result, we are seeing reduced economic growth in the communities that need it the most. I'm excited to hear from our witnesses today on the success they have had building their businesses and about the opportunities you see on the horizon. But I also want to hear about the challenges you're facing to grow and expand. That is because the businesses you run and the high-paying jobs you create only tell part of the story. 
Outdoor recreation has been shown to cut healthcare costs by reducing stress and obesity rates, along with bringing families and friends closer together while also protecting the environment. As we look to build sustainable businesses on Main Street across the country, outdoor recreation offers a pathway to prosperity for millions of entrepreneurs and, and small firms across the country. I again want to thank our witnesses for being here today. I now like to yield to the ranking member, Mr. Shaba, for his open statement. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, for um, holding this important hearing and in, uh, enjoying the outdoors as one of the nation's most cherished uh, hobbies, from small children running in their backyards to retirees uh, motoring across the country in RVs. Americans love outdoor recreation. It's no wonder that, according to the Department of Commerce, the industry is playing a larger and larger role in our economy. The outdoor recreation industry contributed approximately $427 billion to the country's gross domestic product in 2017. As a percentage, that's roughly 2.2%. Uh, Although we tend to think of traditional outdoor companies like hiking and biking outfitters, the entire outdoor recreation industry encompasses so much more. It's also intertwined with supporting industries like travel and tourism and construction. From a jobs perspective, the industry employed over 5 million workers in 2017. It's no surprise that many of these workers are employed by small businesses. The relatively new Department of Commerce study also showcased state-level data to provide a clearer picture of this ecosystem. For example, Florida was the leader when it came to boating and fishing. Colorado was the uh, leader when it came to snow activities, and Illinois led all states for the RVing category, and Ohio leads the nation in everything else. Um, <laughs> I don't think so. Not really. I just wanted to see if anybody was listening, and they were. Also, put in a plug for my state, Ohio. A great state, by the way. All this information is important uh, to Congress as we continue to construct uh, pro-growth policies that move our country forward. Today, we'll be hearing from small businesses that populate uh, the main streets of America's outdoors. I'm looking forward to hearing from each witness about their background and their small business story. With the aging of our population, I'm also interested in hearing more about the trends in their industries. Uh, additionally, improving the nation's infrastructure is vitally important to a healthy and growing outdoor recreation industry. I'm looking forward to hearing from each witness how they view the debate surrounding infrastructure and what Congress should do uh, moving forward. These issues not only impact the outdoor recreation industry, but they also impact all of America's small businesses, entrepreneurs, and startups. When small businesses are creating, growing, and expanding, so does our economy. I want to thank every witness for taking time away from their businesses today. I want to thank you, Madam Chair, and yield back. Thank you, Mr. Shabbat. The gentleman yields back, and if committee members have an opening statement prepared, we will ask that they be submitted for the record. I would like to just take a minute uh, to explain the timing rules. Each witness gets five minutes to testify, and the members get five minutes for questioning. There is a lighting system to assist you. The green light will be on when you begin, and the yellow lights come on comes on when you have one minute remaining. The red light comes on when you are out of time and we ask that you stay within the time frame to the best of your ability. I, would I now would like to introduce our witnesses. Our first witness is uh, Mr. Ray Rusker, Executive Director of Headwaters Economics, an independent nonprofit research group uh, that works to improve community development and land management decisions. After obtaining a BS in wildlife biology from the University of Washington and master's in agriculture from Colorado State University, Mr. Rusker went on to study economics, earning a PhD from the College of Forestry from Oregon State University. He has written widely on rural development and the role of environmental quality in economic prosperity. Thank you, Mr. Rusky, and welcome. Our second witness is Mr. Frank Paul Anthony King, and he, he is a constituent of Mr. Vizi, uh, and he will be introducing him. Uh, Madam Chair, thank you very much. Um, I'm very uh, excited to introduce our second wit witness, uh, who is Mr. Frank uh, Paul Anthony King, who is the president and CEO of Temple Fork Outfitters uh, in Dallas, Texas. Uh, Temple Fork Outfitters has assembled uh, the world's most accomplished, uh, crafty, 
uh, anglers uh, to design a complete line of fishing rods priced to bring Americans more uh, into the sport, which as an outdoorsman, I 100% support. Uh, Temple Fork Outfitters has a mission of keeping our nation's rivers, streams, lakes, and oceans in good shape for the next generation of anglers uh, because Mr. King believes uh, there is no better way to connect with nature than through fishing. Mr. King, uh, welcome. Uh, thank you very much for taking the time to come uh, from Dallas-Fort Worth up here to the nation's capital. Uh, and we look forward to hearing from you. Madam Chair, I'll yield back. Thank you. Our third witness is Ms. Lindsay Davis, who is a constituent of Representative McAdams. Thank you to Congressman McAdams for joining us this morning. I turn it over to you to introduce Ms. Davis. Thank you. Thank you, Chairwoman Velasquez and Ranking Member, member uh, for allowing me in to introduce this third witness, Ms. Lindsay Davis. Lindsay is the CEO and co-founder of Wilder Goods. That's the first female-founded benefit corporation in the state of Utah. Lindsay is passionate about building ethical brands, blending commerce and conservation, and helping to protect Utah's most special places, of which we have many, uh, even leading Ohio. So, <laughs> um, She's also a constituent of Utah's 4th Congressional District. Madam Chair, I move the gentleman's words oh. be taken down. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Lindsay and her team at Wilder Goods are creating and implementing a plan for business to be a catalyst for positive social change. She's an advocate for uniting different outdoor recreation user groups around issues of access, wildlife management, and habitat protection. Utah has a long reputation of a thriving outdoor recreation economy, and I'm glad to see that legacy continue with Wilder Goods and Lindsay. So thank you for joining us today. I would now like to yield to our ranking member, Mr. Shabot, to introduce our Final witness. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I'd like to recognize the uh, gentleman uh, from Minnesota, Mr. Hagedorn, uh, to uh, introduce our next. Well, thank you, uh, Chairwoman Velasquez and Ranking Member Chavit. Uh, I'm uh, proud to introduce as one of our witnesses today, uh, John Wooden, who is uh, testifying on behalf of the National Marine Manufacturers Association about how infrastructure is critical to recreational access in our nation. John is the president and founder of River Valley Power and Sport Inc which sells ATVs, boats, trailers, motorcycles, you name it, and uh, has several locations across Minnesota, including two or three in southern Minnesota in our district in the Rochester area. Now, John founded his business in 1996 upon graduating from Winona State University, a uh, institution of uh, fine uh, higher learning there in southern Minnesota in our district. And uh, their, their business now accounts for, what, $85 million in revenue and over 120 employees. So very, very successful. John and his wife, Carrie, who's with him today, uh, they reside in Red Wing, which is part of Congresswoman Craig's district, I should add. And uh, they have do many things in the community, including they're on the board at St. Joseph's Catholic Church, coach of the youth hockey team, talking about uh, how your kids are playing hockey and doing so well, and uh, part of the co-chair of the Spader Business 20 group. And uh, with that, uh, thank you for being here, John, and uh, we look forward to your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Hagerdon. And now, uh, Mr. Rosker, you're recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairwoman Velasquez and members of the committee. Um, thank you for the invitation. I'm happy to be here. Um, I'm the executive director of Headwaters Economics. We're based out of Bozeman, Montana. Uh, we do a lot of research on uh, the outdoor uh, economy. I was part of the team that was hired by the Bureau of Economic Analysis to put their figures together. Um, every year we have 145 million Americans who play outdoors. And when we play outside, we spend a lot of money, more than $887 billion a year. Um, as was mentioned before, that's um, hard to understand how big that number is unless you put it into context. It's more than we spend, it's more than twice what we spend on motor vehicles every year. And as a result of these expenditures, on everything from gas for our cars and hunting and fishing, uh, we create about 7.6 million jobs nationwide. So it's obviously a very large industry. Uh, recently, the Bureau of Economic Analysis um, estimated the size of the outdoor recreation in terms of its contribution to gross domestic product. It's 2.2% of GDP. Um, in Montana, it's 5.1% of GDP. We only got beat by Hawaii, who was slightly larger than us. So I come from a state where outdoor recreation is a very large industry. It's a big part of our lifestyle. 2.2% um, of GDP, to put that into perspective, that's bigger than, than the contribution from all educational services, all schools and universities combined. 
It's uh, bigger than motor vehicle sales. It's, it's bigger than our air transportation industry. So it's obviously big. It's also growing faster. Um, in 2017, U.S. GDP grew by 2.4%. Uh, the contribution from outdoor recreation grew by 3.9%. So it's, it's clearly a very large uh, part of our economy. We also know that more and more people are choosing to live in communities with a high quality of life and that business owners use outdoor recreation as a way to recruit talent. So for a lot of communities, access to the outdoors is a competitive economic advantage. Investment in outdoor recreation infrastructure makes economic sense. Um, on our website, we have more than 140 economic studies that document the many ways that, that hiking and biking trails, picnic areas, fishing access sites, and other infrastructure contribute to uh, local economies. And a lot of these studies show that developing outdoor recreation infrastructure yields a very high return on investment. For example, um, the development of hiking and biking trails in Whitefish, Montana, resulted in 68 new jobs and $1.9 million in labor income. And so this is in part from tourists who spend money in local shops and hotels and restaurants. However, the trail system also leverages investment from local residents. Our research shows that locals who use the trails around Whitefish spend twice as much on local gear shops as those who do not use the trails. So for every $1 spent on developing trail infrastructure, there was a $2.5 return to the local economy. Another example of an effective investment in, in outdoor recreation can be found in the Methow Valley of North Central Washington, famous for its extensive system of summer trails and groomed winter ski tracks. In the Methow, for every dollar spent on trail infrastructure, there was a $6 return to local businesses. The Federal Land and Water Conservation Fund has been an essential tool for developing outdoor recreation infrastructure. It has supported more than 1,200 projects in all 50 states. Let me give you an example of the importance of LWCF funds for the state of Montana, where I live. We have 170,000 miles of river uh, with spectacular opportunities for fishing. But our rivers are meaningless unless we have access to them. And Montana has invested heavily in recreation access. There are 332 fishing access sites in Montana. Each one costs about $150,000 to develop. That's a total bill of $50 million. But the return on investment is significant. For that $50 million, um, when you look at anglers who spend money in Montana, every year they spend $900 million a year. And this benefits local businesses throughout the state. So this success is largely due to investments made possible through the Land and Water Conservation Fund. Um, let me conclude with an observation on the role of federal public lands in outdoor recreation. In 2016, there were 592 million visits to man lands managed by the National Park Service, Fish and Wildlife Service, Forest Service, and Bureau of Land Management. Visitors to these federal lands spent enough money to create 551,000 jobs in local communities. Paradoxically, the deferred maintenance backlog for these four agencies is estimated to be close to $20 billion. So in summary, an investment in outdoor recreation infrastructure yields a large return in terms of jobs, profits, and uh, for local businesses. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Frasca. Mr. King, you're recognized for five minutes. Good morning, Madam Chair, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for this opportunity to testify today. Temple Fork Outfitters is a 25-year-old Texas-based manufacturer and distributor of fishing rods. By every traditional measure, we're a quintessential small business in the outdoor rec industry. Prior to spending the past decade in the fishing segment of outdoor rec industry, my career focused on investing in businesses outside this industry. This prior experience gives me a broad perspective from which to consider the uniqueness of small business and outdoor rec. To understand the force of nature that small businesses become in our industry, there are three critical attributes of which to be aware, reach, alignment, and leverage. These attributes drive a disproportionately greater level of advocacy and support for policies of interest to outdoor rec and its participants than is witnessed in other industries, reach. Temple Fork and most outdoor rec businesses are small, However, their apparent footprint is not an accurate indicator of their reach. 
For example, Temple Fork employees and domestic sales representatives live in 30 different states. We manufacture in five countries, while our products are sold in 25 countries through several thousand locations, as well as online, and we're followed via social media by hundreds of thousands of anglers globally. As Thomas Friedman extolled in 2005, the world is flat, and as you know, small businesses increasingly can have a supersized effect on their industries. This reach of these businesses is magnified because unlike any other industry of which I'm aware, this industry is a subset of its participants. A hundred percent of the industry is subsumed within the community of consumers. Thus, the industry and consumers form an exceptionally connected community with extremely broad reach. Alignment. In addition to the broad reach that the outdoor rec community exists, in my experience, no other industry can rival the extent to which it's fueled by passion. These businesses, representing 5.2 million direct jobs, are more akin to mission-driven nonprofit organizations because of their large share of common interest with the 146 million customers with respect to overarching requirements for a sustainable environment in which to recreate and the necessity of access to it. This alignment is reflected by the Outdoor Recreation Roundtable, a coalition of outdoor rec industry trade associations representing thousands of diverse businesses providing products and services to millions of outdoor recreation consumers. The Roundtable prioritizes environmental conservation and access to it. And while alignment is not at all perfect across this community on issues as complex and difficult as the environment and access, the key factor is that alignment is significantly higher than exists within any other remotely as large a group of American consumers. Leverage. Broad reach across a networked community with alignment of purpose results in outdoor rec small businesses exhibiting an exponential amount of leverage when compared to peers in other segments of industry. Regardless of the subgroup within outdoor rec, the health and sustainability of our natural resources is always the first and foremost priority because it's the outdoor rec community's most valuable asset. Outdoor rec and its numerous small businesses cannot exist without lands and water on which to recreate. For this reason, an ever-increasing level of collective action, outdoor advocacy, and sustainability initiatives can be expected to flood digital channels as outdoor as the outdoor community flexes the muscle of its shared message. Access to recreate is a more nuanced issue depending almost entirely on the mode and type of transportation involved. However, like the existence of places in which to recreate, the ability of the industry's consumers to gain access in order to recreate is fundamental to its success or failure. Without a doubt, the significant challenges ex that significant challenges exist in finding agreement around levels of access and the modes of transport into recreational areas. However, there is only agreement within the industry regarding the requirement for access. Therefore, balancing sustainability with the risk of overuse will receive increasing attention by Outdoor Rec's leveraged network. Since Temple Fork is focused on fishing and its participants, I've included in my written testimony several legislative priorities and policies specifically affecting fishing habitat and fishing access. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Keene. Ms. Davis. Thank you, Chairwoman Velasquez, Ranking Member Shabbat, and members of the committee. I'm honored to be here today on behalf of the outdoor recreation industry. This hearing truly represents the strength and purpose of our business community. As we've heard this morning, our industry is made up of over 100,000 businesses, accounts for 5.2 million American jobs and 2.2% of GDP. We contribute 778 billion in economic output, surpassing other sectors such as mining, agriculture, utilities, and chemical products manufacturing. The majority of the recreation economy is made up of small businesses run by passionate people who love the outdoors. I'm one of them. I'm the, I'm the CEO of a women-owned and operated retailer called Wilder Goods. As we've heard, we're the first female-founded benefit corporation in the state of Utah and the only women-owned retailer in the outdoor industry. Wilder is an online marketplace for the modern outdoors woman. We're a multi-vendor platform for active, adventurous women for whom sustainability in products and conservation in ecosystems are paramount. 
We started as a benefit corporation to ensure our company would have a triple bottom line in perpetuity, people, planet, and profit. Our shopping experience uses icons and product stories in order to educate our customers and make them aware of their global impact. Since our founding in 2016, we've worked with over 85 innovative and sustainable brands, 38 of which are female-founded companies, 15 of which are also B Corps. We've been recognized by Outside Magazine, Forbes, Fast Company, and Be The Change Media, and we're also a graduating scholar of the Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small Business Program. Conducting business in a way that protects and preserves our natural resources is core to our mission. Our company has partnered with two nonprofits, the Greening Youth Foundation and Outdoor Alliance, to engage our audience in social and environmental justice and relevant conservation initiatives. I came to the outdoor industry after 12 years in the nonprofit sector. As a lifelong outdoors woman, I saw how my consumerism was affecting our human and environmental health, and I realized I had the unique skills and vantage point to do something about it. Our recreation industry is intrinsically connected to issues of sustainability and conservation. We see the toll we're taking on our ecosystems firsthand every year in our snowpack, the health of our fisheries, and our oceans, and our wildlife populations. As a new hunter and angler, I see the effects of our growing population and economy have on it specifically wildlife and habitat. Thriving ecosystems are the backbone of our economy, and federally, federally managed lands and waters are a core component, hosting more than 1 billion visits annually. The health of our industry truly relies on public access and infrastructure by way of trails, waterways, and wildlife corridors. Addressing the maintenance backlog by investing in green and blue infrastructure will improve visitation, make it possible to sustain wildlife, and allow recreationalists to continue building lifelong relationships to the outdoors. Much of our infrastructure is overused and overlooked, leaving it unsafe and inadequate for our growing population. This makes one of the biggest challenges facing the outdoor recreation economy, making sure that Congress allocates enough funding for our public lands. Legislation like Restore Our Parks and Public Lands Act would address our maintenance needs and provide funding to improve our public lands and waters infrastructure. Full funding for the Land and Water Conservation Fund would provide certainty and ac for access projects like parks, trails, and recreation around the country, which will help businesses and communities plan and invest in recreation. The SOAR Act will help guides and outfitters have the certainty they need to run trips and programs, and the Recreation Red, Not Red Tape Act would allow for the prioritization of recreation and land management systems. Our industry is aligned across the spectrum on many of these issues thanks to groups like Outdoor Recreation Roundtable. They are bringing the business community together to advocate for the policies and infrastructure we depend on. We're all ready to work with you to ensure that our public land system evolves to meet the needs and challenges of the next century. Small businesses like mine are taking things into our own hands, but we can't do it alone. We're looking to Congress as a partner in solving these issues. Please help us care for our shared outdoor heritage to ensure outdoor recreation and its economic benefits can continue to be foundational aspects of American jobs, the American economy, and the American experience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Davis. Mr. Wooden. Good morning, Madam Chair, uh, Ranking Member Shabbat, and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to be, be to appear before you today to discuss the role small business plays in outdoor recreation economy and the federal government's role in supporting the industry's continued economic expansion. My name is John Wooden, and I live in Red Wing, Minnesota. Like 70% of our fellow Minnesotans, I'm an outdoorsman, I'm a hunter, a fisherman, a boater, and a power sports enthusiast. I'm extremely fortunate in that I'm also able to further foster the enjoyment of the great outdoors through my business. River Valley Companies, which owns and operates seven retail locations across Minnesota and is celebrating its 24th year in business this year. Among the many recreational product lines our company retails are brands like Minnesota-based Polaris Industries and Alumacraft Boats. Just last month, the Bureau of Economic Analysis, BEA, released an updated report reaffirming the outdoor recreation's role as a significant economic driver generating $778 billion in gross economic output and supporting 5.2 million American jobs while outpacing the overall U.S. economy. Boating and fishing are top contributors to outdoor recreation's economic prowess, which comes as no surprise considering 141 million Americans take to the water each year. In Minnesota alone, the boating economy generates $3.1 billion in economic activity, supporting nearly 11,000 jobs and 700 marine businesses in the state. For the first time, BEA's work was expanded to measure outdoor recreation's economic impact in each state, finding that it accounts for 2.6 of my state's GDP. 
While this report serves as an invaluable tool for policymaking decisions at every level of government, the one key takeaway is that recreation is an economic necessity in my home state of Minnesota and in every state across the nation. As a testament to the growing outdoor recreation and boating industries, River Valley recently opened up an all-new 60,000-square-foot marine center in Rochester, Minnesota. Another eye-opening figure I'll reference is $20 billion, the combined maintenance and repair backlog on our nation's federal lands and water system. Looking at this figure makes the BEA data even more impressive given the out that outdoor small businesses across the country have been able to not just survive but thrive despite the crumbling conditions of the physical environment we do business in. From national parks and marine sanctuaries to recreational areas managed by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and U.S. Forest Service, the federal government manages hundreds of millions of acres of public lands, waters that offer unparalleled opportunities for a variety of recreational activities. These recreation assets, so many of which are falling onto the backlog at a rapid pace, are integral to keeping the outdoor industry open for business. The time to improve recreational infrastructure is now, and Congress must act. Fortunately, we are all hearing that several infrastructure bills are expected to advance in 2020, presenting a prime opportunity to enact a more comprehensive approach to federal infrastructure policy that addresses outdoor recreation needs. For starters, Congress should reauthorize the Sport Fish Restoration and Boating Trust Fund in fixing America's Surface Transportation Act, FAST, which would continue this critical user pay program that funds conservation and infrastructure projects in all 50 states. The boating community led the charge to establish the trust fund nearly 70 years ago. Today, we provide the vast majority of funding to the $650 million program. Expanding broadband across in federally managed lands and waters is a common sense proposal and should be incorporated in FAST. Access to broadband is not just about trolling websites and uploading selfies. It enables boaters to safely navigate our nation's waterways and remain up to date on changing weather conditions. Additionally, Congress should make sure recreation gets a fair share in how the Army Corps of Engineers decides which water infrastructure bills receive priority and the Water Resources Development Act is an appropriate vehicle for this, for this fix. It's important to note that the Corps is one of the nation's leading federal providers of outdoor rec with more than 400 lake and river projects in 43 states, yet antiquated project prioritization processes don't account for recreation as an economic benefit and prevent the agency from carrying out infra infrastructure projects like dredging that are critical to safe navigable marine recreation, as well as the countless local economies that rely on recreational boating's economic footprint. The boating industry looks forward to continuing to work with the members of the committee and other committees of jurisdiction to increase and expand opportunities for recreation on our public lands and waters and maximize the economic contributions to the outdoor economy. Thank you for the opportunity to, be, to appear before you today. I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, uh, Mr. Wooden, and thank uh, to all the witnesses, it's it just uh, incredible um, the stories that you share with us and to recognize the important role that the recre outdoor recreation industry play in our economy. And uh, I want to bring some of those uh, jobs to New York, not only upstate New York, but also downstate uh, New York City. So I would like to ask, and um, basically, all of you mentioned the importance of the Federal Land and Water Conservation Fund in that it has supported more than 1,200 uh, projects in all 50 states. I also sit on the Natural Resources Committee and I supported H.R. 3195 when it passed out of the committee. Can you talk, Mr. Rusker, about the importance of fully funding the Land and Water Conservation Fund in the context of the out? door recreation industry? Um, sure. Um, it's, it, you know, interestingly enough, we, we have on our website, um, if you just type in LWCF, you can see all the various projects and how they've been tracked across um, different states. Um, all 50 states benefit from LWCF. And they benefit in a variety of ways. Uh, it protects uh, cultural heritage sites, uh, protects uh, fishing access sites and hunting access sites, uh, working landscapes, uh, farms and ranches benefit from LWCF, um, city parks. So it's, it's across the board, it's across the country. Um, 
I, I will point out that as a research group that is very much into uh, data, it's very difficult to track how LWCF funds are spent. Um, we had a friend at Interior who was able to share some information and has since moved on, so the information disappears. But we do have the 1,200 projects is from that data ends in 2014. So there's no recent data on how LWCF funds have been spent. Thank you. Mr. King, it is my understanding that the outdoor recreation industry suffers from the perception that it is only a seasonal industry. Uh, what can be done to market jobs in the outdoor recreation economy and all the career opportunities it has to offer to get around the stigma that these jobs are just only seasonal in, in nature? I, I would say that I think that what you're seeing is that that stigma might exist in, um, let's say, older age group folks. Mm -hmm. And that, in fact, what we're seeing is that in um, uh, Generation Z, millennials, an enormous amount of uh, understanding about the opportunities in the industry and even greater participation in outdoor rec at younger ages than we saw in some previous generations. And so while I, I absolutely acknowledge that there may be some opportunity to show older folks that the jobs are out there, Right now, uh, there's a lot of people very interested in finding jobs that are passion-driven instead of profitability-driven, and a lot of folks interested in the industry. Thank you. Um, this uh, question is open for anyone in the panel to answer. Over 144 million Americans participate in outdoor recreation, and the industry is growing supporting 300,000 in my home state of New York. But I think many people view this industry as only existing in rural communities. What more can the industry do to build a broader, more inclusive customer base that reflects our country's rich and increasing diversity? Mr. Ross. I'll, I'll, I'll take a stab at that. If you look at the recent BEA numbers, uh, the numbers, um, the, the, the estimate of what activities are involved in the production of goods and services that, that contribute to gross domestic product, um, they've split it up into sort of nature-based versus other. And, and the fastest growing is nature-based. So that's skiing and hiking and hunting right. and the sort of things we could imagine happening in the great outdoors. But for the first time now, BEA has also measured activities that tend to take place more closer to larger metropolitan areas. Mm -hmm. um, soccer, volleyball, uh, golf, uh, activities that occur in more of a man-made environment. So there are now metrics of that, and it's significant, and it's growing very quickly. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Davis, uh, our committee is very focused on supporting entrepreneurs. As the CEO of your own company, I commend you for taking, you know, the risk to start up uh, your own business. Are you seeing more people start businesses in this industry? And have you noticed a common thread that spurs them to do so? Thank you for your question and an acknowledgement of startup hustle. <laughs> um, yes, you know, kind of in response to this question about diversity, I think our industry is changing a lot right now. We're very young, like the first kind of role of leadership is now turning over. We're getting more women in business. We're getting more startups. We're getting more entrepreneurs as the growing demographic of young people getting outside just continues to skyrocket and skyrocket. And so you're absolutely right that people are looking to align their passions with purpose and their careers. Um, I get 20 emails a week about how people can work for us. Um, so I think the, the drive is there. Um, we certainly as an industry have a lot of work to do as far as um, building in ramps for involvement into the industry itself. Um, one of our nonprofit partners does a great job of that, the Greening Youth Foundation, and they fast track uh, mostly underserved youth and urban populations' ability to get into careers in the federal land management agencies. Um, but as, from the business perspective, I look to groups like the outdoor um, offices of outdoor recreation to provide resources in addition to the Small Business Development Center, Women's Business Development Center, et cetera. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Wood, Mr. Wood, and my time has expired, but I'm sure uh, the ranking member will be able to uh, direct some of 
his questions to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Rasker, I'll begin with you. Um, the Department of Commerce's report found that uh, the outdoor recreation industry is growing uh, rapidly. Um, why do you believe that is the case, and what can we do, or what would you suggest we do uh, to continue uh, growth in that direction? Well, I, I, you know, one of the things that BEA uh, uncovered was um, some information that we just didn't know before. Um, so it's growing rapidly and it's very big, but it may have been that way for quite some time. Mm -hmm. We're just measuring it for the first time. Yeah. Um, I, I think there's several things going on. I think more and more people around the country are, are really focusing on having a high quality of life. It's important to people. Mm -hmm. And um, people tend to be healthy. Um, even uh, retirees are different from retirees a generation ago. They tend to be healthier and more outdoors oriented. Mm -hmm. I also think there's a lot more opportunity. In a state like Montana, we just have so much access to the outdoors. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Wood, I'll, I'll turn to you next. Um, is there any advice that you would give to a, a person who perhaps lives in a community that's on a body of water or a river? Um, say the Ohio River, uh, and uh, <laughs> might consider uh, purchasing a boat because other people in that community have boats. And uh, uh, what what factors might one consider before making such a, a purchase? That's a great question. And you know, I think uh, Mr. Rasker referenced that. Uh, I think we all, as we're the the times are changing, that we've become electronic in nature. Whether we're talking about a family or you know an individual that uh, the escape to nature is what we sell every day in the boating business, right? So if, uh, if you did it in Ohio or you come to the great state of Minnesota, what we'd say is it's very, very easy to, to get yourself into boating and get your family into boating. Mm -hmm. And so we provide, you know, it's really important uh, for or proper water access. Um, and, and I think that is a, I, I hear that tale across the nation that we, uh, as it becomes more popular, the accessibility to these waterways is is a is a challenge, and the infrastructure has just not been up to date with the usage. Um, I think the other thing that we we'll use the term, our public lands are being loved to death, right? They're being boated to death, if you would, and uh, we just we need some reinvestment. Thank you very much. And along those lines with infrastructure, Ms. Davis, you had mentioned in infrastructure. Are there, what, are there particular things that you would like to see us do uh, at the federal level that could affect, obviously, the, uh, across the country uh, that would improve the various industries that we've talked about here? Yes, absolutely. Um, we go to a lot of closed campgrounds. <laughs> the Forest Service is really struggling to stay up to speed with management and also keeping operations growing, especially with growing wildfire issues. Mm -hmm. So that's a big one. Um, Infrastructure-wise, uh, we are really combating wildlife and development, especially in Salt Lake area with the Wasatch National Forest, which is the most visited national forest in the country. Um, so that, that specific area sees 9 million visitors a year, which is more than all five of the national parks combined. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have, we're using citizen science right now to figure out where the species density is the highest and then work with the Department of Transportation and other agencies to make sound choices about where development should be. Um, but all of those things, you know, really impact someone's ability to enjoy the outdoors, you know, like going somewhere and having it be open or yep. being there and seeing, you know, the most memorable wildlife experience you're going to have. Thank you very much. And Mr. King, with the time that I've got remaining, um, are there trends uh, in angling and in fishing uh, that, that are either positive or negative uh, that, you know, we ought to be concerned about or what, what do you kind of see? Sure. Uh, fishing is kind of, you know, I kind of think of it when I was young, you know, not hole baseball was a big deal. We all did it. Now it's soccer and, you know, bowling and golfing. They all have trends. Where, is, where are the trends in your industry? Sure. There, I think there's two, two trends that are fun to know about. One would address the chairwoman's question. The actually, the, the fastest growing area of fishing is urban fishing. Mm which is fishing in non-traditional waters for folks that necessarily can't get outside town. It's a very interesting area. In fact, one of the, one of the places I could direct you on the, on the internet is just check out fishing in the LA River, hmm. which is all concrete-based fishing, and it's, it's getting a lot, of, a lot of play. The second area is 
because of the decline in infrastructure in our freshwater facilities, the second fastest growing area of fishing and boating potentially is, is in the saltwater, right? Because there's, there's more water and less infrastructure issues. So those are, those are two big, two things going on. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. It's very interesting hearing, so thank you. Yeah. The gentleman yields back, and we recognize uh, Mr. Golden, Chairman of the Subcommittee on Contracting and Infrastructure from Minnesota. Oh, Maine, what I'm doing. <laughs> That's okay. Minnesota's a, <laughs> Minnesota's great, too. I love Minnesota. In fact, I, I went out to Minnesota and did a field hearing. I, I was part of the subcommittee with, with Mr. Stelber, and uh, th I thought it was great. Well, uh, we can all agree, not as good as Ohio, so thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Making a hard push for Ohio today. Uh, you know this is an important subject for, for Maine. and in, in fact, uh, there's a, a graph that's been handed out to committee members that would show that other than, than Montana, uh, in Maine we have the highest uh, uh, percent of our state GDP. Uh, in the year 2017, that's being driven by outdoor recreation activities, tourism, and, and, and other issues. And, um, you know, that's that's just one year, but it's, it's, I'm sure it's like that pretty much year in and year out. Uh, I think, too, uh, the diversity uh, of outdoor recreation in the state of Maine is pretty amazing. We, we've got some good seasons, a nice long winter, uh, you know, beautiful summertime uh, when everyone's trying to get away from, from the heat uh, down here in, in places like this. People even, I think, take into account tourism and outdoor recreation for our fall leaf season. So uh, it, there really is a lot of diversity in the importance of this issue. Uh, it's not lost upon me and, and many people in, in Maine. Uh, I wanted to ask... Uh, some of you have talked about the deferred maintenance backlog. Uh, in Maine, uh, at Acadia National Park, we actually had three and a half million visitors last year, and there's a really uh, substantial maintenance backlog. Uh, I mean, the, the traffic trying to go into this uh, particular national park can be absolutely unbelievable uh, on, on a, a busy summer day. Uh, and the number of people in, in there uh, visiting, it's just obvious that we need to do something about that. Uh, and I'm co-sponsoring the, the legislation. But I, I want to give some of you, anyone that really wants to, the opportunity to elaborate on how you think uh, eliminating this backlog does uh, help uh, businesses, uh, particularly small businesses that are in, in this line of, of business. I'll take that. That's, e that's an easy one for the boating industry, is, is if we have the proper infrastructure, we're going to sell more boats in whatever state the dealership's in. And we continue to hear it day in and day out that the infrastructure, whether it's the highway that beats the boat up on the way there, or it's the, or it's the bridge that isn't existent anymore, or or whatnot. But I, I hear that often. Uh, bringing it back to Minnesota for a minute, um, we have a federal waterway. It's called the Mississippi River, and uh, the Ar Army Corps of Engineers is 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 a is the entity that oversees it, and you know its sole purpose. I believe when it was created was to keep navigable channel for purposes of, of barges and, and bringing commodities up and down, which is very important. We get that. However, another subset, and I think Mr. Rasker mentioned, is we just began to measure um, what, what the economic impact uh, is of, say, boating, for example, in outdoor rack. And uh, I think uh, that needs a little attention uh, as... Uh, the lock and dam systems that, that go up and down the Mississippi River, for one example, are, are just in dire need of additional funding and need some attention. And the recreational boater has been kind of lost uh, uh, waiting for it. Yeah, uh, thanks for pointing that out. And I, I mean, I'd point out too, this has economic impact in Maine, even where we build a lot of boats, uh, whether it be the, the intercoastal uh, uh, highway uh, or uh, people uh, in, in major rivers like you're, you're speaking about, uh, we can reap the benefits. Uh, I've also got a guy in, in Maine uh, who makes uh, jack traps in Monmouth, Maine, uh, who's growing what was a pretty small local business is now becoming more of a nationally uh, focused business with, with broadband, which you spoke about, Mr. Warden, and the ability to market himself into new markets, trying to convince people in Minnesota uh, to give up on uh, 
on the jigging and, and to get into the kind of ice fishing that involves uh, putting uh, some nice ice traps out, high quality ice traps and, and sitting uh, out there in a nice uh, fishing shack. But, uh, you, you know, this is it really, uh, in a small town, uh, the jobs that he's able to create uh, is pretty impressive. But uh, very quickly, um, I, don't, I just wanted to ask if any of you are also familiar uh, with a DOT program. We talk about LWCF here and, and some of the other things with, with national parks, but uh, when it comes to things like hiking, mountain biking, snowmobiling, which is really important in Maine, uh, are you, any of you familiar with DOT's recreational trails program, uh, which I think is also overburdened and, and underfunded, and I was just curious if any of you have heard of the program or, or used it. No one. Well, I'm putting a plug in for it right now. Uh, recreational trails program, uh, you know, high expense uh, for a lot of people to build trails and then maintain them, uh, particularly municipalities. It falls on to taxpayers, uh, property taxpayers and others can't afford it, but uh, the return on investment is awfully high. Uh, particularly, in, I mean, there are communities in Maine that their tourism season is the, the dead of winter uh, for snowmobiling, but the, the uh, maintenance of those trails is incredibly expensive. So thank you. Gentlemen, times have expired, and now we recognize Mr. Hearn from Oklahoma, ranking member of the Subcommittee on Economic Growth, Tax, and Capital Access. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman and Ranking Member Shabbat, and our witnesses for being here today. As an avid outdoorsman, I know the wonders of the outdoor recreational industry and the beauty of the outdoors firsthand. Additionally, through my numerous visits to small businesses in Oklahoma's first district, I've learned the large role that outdoor recreation businesses and these activities play in our nation's economy. This includes my recent visit to Zebco, an outdoor and sporting goods retail company located in my district. While touring Zebco, I gained an even stronger appreciation for this industry and learned a great deal that sport fishing is about much more than just having fun in the outdoors. It's also about creating jobs and generating a stronger economy. Mr. King, uh, you operate a fishing equipment company, which is similar to Zebco. Something I learned through my visit to Zebco was how much the sport fishing community puts back into conservation, conservation efforts throughout the country. I thought this was very insightful and something I would love for other members on this committee and the general public to hear about. Could you describe for us what you and others in the industry are doing to support fisheries conservation and whether it's financially, whether it be financially or otherwise? Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, I think Mr. Wooden actually mentioned it earlier. The Sport Fish Restoration and Boating Trust Fund was put in place many, many decades ago. And what it is is basically every um, every manufacturer of fishing goods as well as some um, other industries uh, has, a, has an excise tax of 10 percent on the products that we sell. That 10 percent equates to about $650 million a year. That $650 million a year primarily goes to the states to support their uh, fishing and hunting um, uh, departments. So off the top, there's $650 million that supports at the state level the, the industry that we're in as well. I think um, without question, our industry is one that supports numerous organizations that also support conservation, such as CCA, such as Trout Unlimited, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars going into conservation directly from the, uh, the organizations as well as their individual participants. Thank you for your thoughts. And clearly, it's, it's pretty fascinating what each of you all do to help your respective areas to maintain the, the conservation of, of, your, of your business, of your, your industry. Um, I believe it's our job in this committee to concentrate on the correct issues impacting the outdoor recreation industry. And I believe these types of hearings are a great way for us to refine our focus to ensure committee is utilizing all of our resources correctly. Do you believe, Mr. King, that Congress is concentrating on the correct issues impacting the outdoor industry at this time? You know, I think that it's fabulous that we're finally recognizing the economic value, the output. I think the thing that we're missing is that is, is that in addition to the output, the natural resources are an asset of this country, and just like any asset, they have to be maintained, and that's a recurring theme here, is that we're taking from the asset, and we're all enjoying hundreds of millions of dollars, hundreds of, almost, you know, almost three quarters of a billion dollars in value out of it, but we're failing to recognize that if we don't continue to invest back into that infrastructure, it, not only are we going to suffer as an industry, the entire nation suffers. So I think that's the only part we're missing here. 
thank each of you for your time today, and I really appreciate all the work you're doing to um, to address the, the issues. And it's uh, obviously it's not the purview of this committee uh, on on infrastructure, but I know it's uh, it's important bipartisan issue that we all would love to work on at this time to move forward to help us all uh, move forward with controlling and, and maintaining our assets. And Madam Chairwoman, I yield back. Gentleman yields back, and now we recognize Ms. Chu uh, from California, Chairwoman of the Subcommittee on Investigations, Oversight, and Regulations. Mr. Rasker, uh, my district is uh, in the Los Angeles County area and is home to the San Gabriel Mountains. And I was part of a decades-long effort to get more resources to these mountains. And we were rewarded in 2014 when President Obama uh, proclaimed it a monument, a San Gabriel Mountains monument. His proclamation recognized that these mountains represented 70% of the open space in the Los Angeles region, and it makes nature accessible to 15 million people. And so protecting these lands as a national monument was key to improving access and opportunities for recreation <coughs> for all these millions. Um, now, when we first began that, this process, uh, naysayers claimed that there would be great harm to the businesses in the mountains, like the skiing business that was in the mountain. Um, and certain nearby cities said that there would be <coughs> overcrowding uh, in their cities. So what would you say to them, uh, what would you tell them about, about the economic benefits that public lands protections like a national monument status could bring for businesses of all types that are located nearby? Um, sure. We, so we, we looked at uh, 10 national monuments that were over 10,000 acres in size. Um, and we looked at economic performance metrics, so per capita income, population growth, population, um, I'm sorry, uh, total personal income, um, and looked at it over time before and after monument designation. And so for all 10 of the monuments we looked at, um, whatever growth trajectory that community was on continued after monument designation. So there's, there's no evidence that, that the monuments create harm. Um, a recent study by uh, Resources for the Future looked at business creation and sees that there's an increase in business creation, business startups, uh, after a monument is designated. Um, it's not just outdoor-related re businesses. It's also people who want to live next to public lands for quality of life reasons. They could be retirees. It could be anybody working in any industry who just happens to want to be in a place where they can, after work, go fly fishing or snowmobiling. Well, I, I wish I had you around when those naysayers were, <laughs> were, were talking, because that's a, that's a very compelling answer. Um, mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, we want to expand on our progress. Uh, my bill, H.R. 2215, the San Gabriel Mountains Foothills and River Protection Act, would expand the San Gabriel Mountains National Monument, designate new wilderness areas and wild and scenic rivers, and establish a new recreation, national recreation area in the foothill communities and river corridor adjacent to the existing national monument. Uh, it would allow communities to partner with the National Park Service to build new facilities like trails and campgrounds to better connect residents to recreation opportunities in the mountains. And in fact, we are fortunate already to see a culture of advocacy and support for outdoor recreation through local nonprofit organizations. We want to expand on this. For instance, we have um, the active, it's called Active SGV and the Nature for All coalitions, which have guided public policy and connected those communities to recreational opportunities. And because they did that, last year REI awarded over $100,000 to these nonprofits in the San Gabriel Valley to support a transit to trail program that connects public transportation hubs to trailheads in the mountains. And we feel this, this in turn spurs economic growth in the foothill communities by enabling more Angelinos to have access to outdoor recreation. So in your research, have you found a connection between public lands advocacy and investment in recreation by businesses and individuals? Um, <clears throat> are you asking whether we've tracked the effectiveness of advocacy? Yeah. Uh, we haven't. <laughs> we haven't specifically looked at that. 
But what would you well, what would you do to make sure that we have uh, what, what would be the specific types of investments that you think should be made to increase growth in in the outdoor recreation industry in areas mm-hmm. like ours? Sure, I'll, I'll just give you an example where I live. I live uh, pretty close to Yellowstone National Park. And we're surrounded by seven national forests. Um, Yellowstone, in the time that I've lived in Bozeman, 30 years went from 3 million visitors to now more than 4 million visitors a year. And when you go into Yellowstone, it's very obvious the infrastructure is crumbling. At the same time, we have tremendous recreation opportunities in the surrounding national forests and BLM land um, that would be much closer to where communities are, uh, much closer to where businesses would benefit, um, but there's no recreation infrastructure. Uh, our Gallatin National Forest, for example, has hardly any recreation staff. Uh, so the, our ability to build new trails and, and welcome people onto our national forests has just disappeared over the last 30 years. And, and I think that's a real, that's a real pity. Mm. Thank you. I yield back. Gentle lady yields back. Um, and now we recognize the gentleman from Minnesota, Mr. Hagerton, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chair and Ranking Member. Appreciate the opportunity. It's good to see all of you. Thanks for your testimony. It's nice to have a fellow Minnesotan here today, uh, especially since our state has so many wonderful outdoor recreation opportunities, beautiful land, and of course, we're the, you know, we're the land of 10,000 lakes, right? Although I think it's more like 15,000 when they actually count them up. And so I'll start with our friend, Mr. Wooden. Yeah, Minnesota's made some efforts to join, I think there's 16 other states you were talking about, uh, to establish outdoor recreation offices. How specifically would that help your business and, uh, and the people in the state of Minnesota and nationally? Yeah, good question. So 16 states have, have uh, adopted the Office of Outdoor Recreation. In Minnesota, we began uh, some testimony earlier this year. And uh, um, so we're, we're in process. But how would it impact the boating industry in, in the state of Minnesota? I think that the big news would be it would give a singular voice to outdoor recreation rather than, you know, we're, we're sort of governed by DNR offices that oversee these resources. We're sort of overseen by the Army Corps of Engineers. But having a singular voice and, and a platform uh, to, to uh, you know, oversee outdoor rec, I think, is the biggest advantage. Mr. Hagenor. That's very good. In your testimony, you mentioned some things, uh, infrastructure, broadband, for instance, and I know there are various ways you could explain how important that is to people who are engaging in recreational activities. Locks and dams, I've actually testified on that myself, how important that is. I think we have six of them in just the two counties on the Mississippi River that that I represent in the first district, and it's something like $80 million per lock and dam to keep those things maintained and over time, and, and that's really important, not just for farmers, but for everyone who uses the waterways. Um, but then you get into other issues, workforce, finding skilled workers. Is that, uh, is that something that any of you are running into, having problems? We hear this all over the place. Is it affecting your businesses? I'll open it up to any of you at this point. I'll, I'll take it as well, but, uh, and I can keep it short, but it's the number one factor inhibiting the growth of the marine industry is, I think it, the fallacy is that, that the jobs we create are not livable wage jobs, and they really are, and there's a lot of skilled jobs that are created in, in our industry, and uh, so it's not being uh, known early on in our schools that, that there's these opportunities in outdoor rec. So um, I think federally and, and at a state level, we need to create more general awareness and then create programming around it. So I know that I, that's a... Big, big issue in Minnesota. One of the companies that supply you with boats is Alumacraft. They're over in St. Peter, Minnesota. I had a chance to tour their operation not too long ago. And they, they have some uh, terrific opportunities, whether it's welding or, you know, all these different things where you're right. People can come right off, get in line, and start making very good wages and have an excellent life. It's too bad that I think for about 20, 30 years, many people have been convinced they shouldn't move into those types of of employment because they said, well, if you don't go to a two or four-year college and all these things, you're just not going to amount to anything. We're trying to reverse that. And the industry that you're testifying for today, the, the National Marine 
Manufacturers Association. I appreciate their support for legislation that Congressman Van Drew and I have introduced that would expand the use of 529 education savings accounts to move towards certificate programs, vocational training, uh, the purchase of tools and equipment, you know, all those apprenticeships. And so we need to make put them on par with the, the four-year institutions. And by doing that, I think we can continue to promote skilled workers and workforce and give people a chance to have choice and to have the life that they, they want. So our legislation is called the American Workforce Empowerment Act, and it's H.R. 4469. I appreciate the industry support, and I'd ask my members on the committee to take a look at that as well. But thank you all for your testimony. I appreciate it. The gentleman yields back. And now we recognize Mr. Evans from Pennsylvania, uh, vice chair of the committee, for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Philadelphia is my home city, and it has the largest park system in America, known as Fairmont Park. Just last week, I attended a walk to in Lupus at Memorial Hall, which is in West Fairmont Park along the Schuylkill River. Memorial Park was built as the art gallery in 1876 as a centennial exposition to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the signing of the Declaration of Independence. Schuylkill River is used for canoeing and rowboating and has been a source of recreation for citizens of Philadelphia for centuries. Dr. Raskin, your testimony further stated that outdoor recreation reduces health care costs. Health care costs as a serious issue to Americans. As a member of the Ways and Means Committee, I voted to support committee passage of House Resolution 3, which helps reduce prescription drug price. Dr. Raskin, how does outdoor recreation reduces health care costs? Uh, it's it's a it's a good question. Uh, there's we have, as I mentioned earlier, uh, a searchable database on our website where you can look at all the different benefits of outdoor recreation and peer-reviewed studies on this. There's there's quite a bit of academic literature um, measuring whether outdoor recreation contributes to uh, better health outcomes, and and the conclusion's fairly solid. Um, People who recreate outdoors are healthier physically, and they're also healthier uh, mentally. Next question I have, and this is to um, all of the panelists. I have often spoken about the need to repair infrastructure in my district and across the country. I say that if you affect the environment, you affect the behavior. Better infrastructure creates better communities. As stated by the panelists today, there's a currently a, main, a maintenance backlog of National Park Service. Independence Hall is also in my uh, congressional district. Among those agencies, which is why I co-sponsored Restore Our Parks and Public Act. To any of the panelists, which happens, when is there maintenance backlog of outdoor recreation infrastructure in terms of usability and safety? So let's start with the old panelists. Um, well, the outdoor enthusiasts that support my business often experience um, lack of trails, lack of cross-country skiing, um, unmaintained climbing anchors, um, terrible toilets or no toilets at all. You know, it's all, the, all these things really contribute to not only your overall experience, but the safety and, you know, even ability to meet up with other people when you're there. Um, so I think investment in infrastructure can only improve people's experience and not only their ability to get outside. Anyone else? The poverty rate in Philadelphia is nearly 25%. Poverty means that large portions of Philadelphians are not able to travel long distance or buy expensive equipment for activities such as skiing and hiking. To any of the panelists, can you illustrate why people in my district, an urban area with its share of poverty and crime, should care about outdoor recreation? try to tackle this one. Um, so I think as an industry, we have, this is one of our biggest jobs to do is to really actively work on diversifying who recreates outside and why. And so like from our business perspective, we've done a lot um, really in 
representation and, and putting people of color and diverse backgrounds and from places and acknowledging that a walk in a park in your city is just as valid an outdoor experience as climbing a mountain somewhere. Um, so that further broadens our community and acknowledges who's outside and who's allowed to call themselves an outdoors person. Um, and so from there, I mean, we've heard a lot about how our industry has a lot of work to do in terms of creating job fairs, you know, making sure people understand that this is a viable career path for them. And we certainly have even more work to do there with communities, urban communities, communities of color. This is why I look so much to the Greening Youth Foundation who works directly with that population to encourage them and also financially support their ability to get into conservation careers. So I think as we not only change the face of the outdoor industry, but also change the face of conservation, we will really chip away at that issue. Uh, Madam Chair, you're back to balance of my time. Thank you. Thank you. Gentleman yields back. Now we recognize the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Bishop, for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairman. And, I, you know, this is a very important to my state. I have statistics furnished to me is we've got 260,000 jobs, $28 billion worth of consumer spending, and $8.3 billion of wages in North Carolina. It's, it's a big deal. You guys have been in macro numbers. That certainly brings it home to me. I've been... Uh, Minded as I've been hearing your testimony, uh, and each of you have spoken to, and the materials provided to us uh, speak to the question of uh, sort of the, I think uh, you put it best for me, Mr. Wooden, the, uh, our uh, uh, public lands being loved to death, uh, public lands and facilities, and, uh, and there being backlogs, large backlogs in maintenance and, and uh, uh, infrastructure investment need. And I was wondering, as I, as I listened to a lot of that, I thought about a concept I've learned many years ago, and, I, and as an economist, I guess, Dr. Rasker, you're an economist uh, on the panel, I was thinking about the tragedy of the commons, as they used to describe it. Is that a phenomenon we're dealing with here? And, and uh, as you each have, I, and do you, uh, I'm interested in each of your perspectives, are we looking primarily to resolve this problem for, through generalized public investment, or should there be privatized means of uh, of addressing this shortfall like user fee based uh, uh, options and, and maybe Dr. Rasker I'll address it to you as that's your profession and again I'm off uh, way over my skis but I remember that uh, concept and I'm just curious about your outlook. So uh, if we go back to the tragedy of the Commons original article it was uh, not so much about privatization as it was about the management of the Commons and I think that's where we're talking about the maintenance backlog being such a big deal on places where uh, there's federal public lands. You know, in the West, almost half of our land is managed by federal agencies. So that's why we talk about federal public lands a lot, but it's not the case in other parts of the country. Um, one of the things that BEA did was measure government's contribution to outdoor recreation investment by, by government agencies. And it's significant, it's $34 billion uh, that government is spending. Um, only four billion of that, about 12%, is from federal agencies. So much of the effort is being carried by state and local governments. And it's, so it's, it's bond measures, it's uh, you know, excise taxes, it's increasing your local sales tax and earmarking that for, for parks and rec. Um, so uh, it, I think there's a, there's, there's a lot more potential for the federal government to weigh in. Anyone else want to comment on the subject matter? If you, if you have this issue of the depletion, it, it seems to me sort of paradoxical. Uh, you have, uh, we want to have growth in this industry for the benefits that it pays into the economy, uh, but it also seems to the extent we have growth, we paradoxically increase the demands on the public assets. Is, is that also true, Dr. Rasker? And, and is that just, a, a, just, do we just need a higher level of public spending on it? Is that the, is that the point? Uh, I think in terms of the federal government, that's definitely the case. Uh, the federal government has really fallen behind in its investment in, in, in infrastructure for outdoor recreation. And you could see the return on investment is significant. But, but let's not forget, a lot of um, this is so important to people that when you pass a local bond measure and you ask uh, local citizens to increase their property taxes, and earmark that for outdoor recreation infrastructure, that sort of effort passes um, in a remarkably high degree across the country. In other words, people are stepping up and paying for this personally out of their taxes. 
Um, so, you know, it's time for the federal government, I think, to be a partner in this. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Uh, King, I, it, it, my notes indicate, and I missed it as you delivered the testimony, but your testimony made reference to the Recreation Not Red Tape Act. Is that correct, sir? Did you have a reference to that? I do in my written testimony, yes, sir. Yeah, that it removes barriers and offers sensible 21st century proposals for identifying and appropriately managing our unparalleled outdoor recreation assets now and into the future. Can you talk about the barriers briefly in the time you've got less barriers that the legislation would remove? I mean, I think what we're trying to say is that um, instead of creating more red legislative red tape and creating businesses and opportunities to become involved in the industry, that we should like a lot of things, we should streamline this and make it easier for folks to get involved, which ultimately results in more, more conservation-minded individuals and ultimately results in more constituents willing to support more funds going back into the recreation industry. Thank you very much. Madam Chairman, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Let me uh, take this opportunity to thank all the witnesses for taking time out of their schedules to be here with us today. Your testimonies were compelling, and your experience truly informs our work in this committee. We know that the economic prosperity of our nation is increasingly impacted by the growing outdoor recreation economy, which is served by many small businesses responsible for over $400 billion worth of economic output and supporting over 5 million jobs. The outdoor economy is a growing force. But the lack of investment in our public lands and infrastructure are creating headwinds for the industry. I look forward to working with members on both sides of the aisle to support this part of the economy and addressing some of the challenges uh, that you're facing. With that, I ask unanimous consent that members have five legislative dates, uh, days to submit a statement and supporting materials for the record without objection, so order. And if there's no further business to come before the committee, we are adjourned. Thank you.